the final season of Succession is the ultimate test for Kendall Roy. Now that his father is finally out of the picture, can he become the killer his father doubted he could be? Is the bro -y tribute band actually stone-hearted and smart enough to pull it off? We're death wrestling with ogres. Bah. You're reading documents. Much of Succession so far has been the story of Kendall repeatedly attempting to metaphorically kill his father in business, only to fail spectacularly, get pulled back into his dad's orbit, and sink back into a depressive state and his pattern of substance abuse. So after all these failures, it seemed like the initial frontrunner was pretty much out of the running to inherit the Waystar Roy Co. top job and replace Logan Roy. It ain't gonna be me. <laughs> Yet something fundamental has changed in Kendall this season. He's no longer giving himself away, and when everyone expects him to blow it as usual, now rebranded Kendall goes woo-woo. He's shocking them all by holding it together. General buzzes. What? How was it? Really good. So is Kendall the new king? Long live the king! Or when actor Jeremy Strong tells Vulture this is the closest the character has flown to the sun, does that mean a fall is still coming? Let's look at what's going on with Kendall and whether he has the most important quality it will take to win in succession. On-screen bros are usually one-dimensional villains or laughing stocks, beloved heroes of a frat boy antics movie, or else they're proven to have hidden depth. But we never really see a bro on screen like Kendall Roy, the billionaire bro, wannabe tech bro, and striving to be woke bro. Woke star boy cop. Who desperately wants to be more, yet remains a total bro. I'd like my Twitter to be off the hook. This could all get super earnest, so I was thinking of hitting up some Bojack guys just to smash that shit, make my feet a little powder keg people need to check in with. A lot of who Kendall really is comes through in his language. While he thinks of himself as this sensitive, expansive soul and peppers his discourse with a wide range of illusions. End times. Right. Weimar meets Carthage meets Dante meets AI. Right. And antibiotic resistance super bugs. Most of his speech is just cheesy. I think Volter is the shiz. We're the shiz? and the content is empty. The vision he outlines to his siblings in season three is the ultimate jargon-filled disruptor tech nonsense, lacking all substance. We can become omninational and reposition. Information is going to be more precious than water in the next hundred. Detoxify our brand and we can go supersonic. Mixed with the corny tech gibberish, he talks in the profanity-ridden, dick-measuring, corporate raider style that's trying to ape his dad. So, we ready to f*** who up. I hear you bent for him. While he reveals himself in this speech style, perhaps Kendall's biggest weakness comes through in how he's pathologically incapable of listening. He's obsessed with hiring the best people, but interrupts every time they say a word. And that's just an offer on the f*** off, Tom? In pitch meetings or negotiations, he rushes in to get whatever he wants to say out, coming across as obnoxious or making obvious gaffes. So? That's okay. I don't need to hear the pitch. I've been through the deck and uh, I get it. With no self-awareness of how he's being received or what other people think, it's a known fact that many powerful people in business, like Logan, tend to speak less, leave pauses before letting others know what they're thinking, and impose their authority by not revealing themselves. But it feels like Kendall is always cutting people off because he's afraid he'll lose the great point he's about to make. The first time we meet him, he's pumping himself up to play the part of the successful businessman with music. But when we cut out to watch him without hearing the music in his headphones, the effect is ridiculous. Ground stones, water towers, trees, skyscrapers. He's always continuing this pumping himself up act, always feeling on the verge of some great move that he won't quite pull off when the moment comes. Relentlessly positive sounding, even when obvious downs need to be acknowledged. It's not a big deal. It's an opportunity. We just, we just, you know, flip a big name, boom, it's all good. Totally. It's all right. good. So his upbeat energy is tense, hollow, and reveals a fundamental lack of faith in himself. And because he's so fixated on the Kendall performance, he loses the opportunities to focus on what others want. Like when he could have gotten his siblings to follow him in season three by playing to their motives. After all this being so well established about Kendall, what's striking in season four is that we're finally starting to see him do what seemed impossible for him. Him, keep things to himself, have secrets, not show his hand, and successfully play others. In season four, episode four, we see this new era of Kendall begin when he blackmails Hugo to go behind his siblings' back and spread dirt on their dad. Then in episode five, Kendall lets Roman lose it with Lucas Madsen and potentially make himself vulnerable. We're not selling to you, okay? We're not doing that. You just f yourself. Whereas the old Kendall wouldn't have been able to hold himself back from swooping in there. 
in episode 6, as the Roys gear up for a new product launch and the Roy brothers try to tank the Matson deal, people are viewing both brothers as out of their depth, weak, and not worthy of the respect given their father. Wow. You are a weak monarch in a dangerous no. interregnum. You don't treat me with sufficient respect. And if you f*** up his deal, or you try to stand up numbers that I am not comfortable with, I swear to God. Hey, easy. And Rome does regress and self-destruct under the pressure, firing not one but two incredibly senior and competent women in an impulsive display of extreme pettiness, then choking before the presentation and letting Kendall get all the kudos when it actually goes well. Meanwhile, everyone is looking at Kendall to likewise repeat his usual pattern of extreme grandiosity followed by a crash. You think it's nuts? No, no, I mean, no. you know, I mean, pitching f***ing playhouses and living forever and then doubling up the f***ing numbers. Time. He's characteristically spouting all the bro-y jargon nonsense. Just break the logjam. Get the franchise pump pumping. Pump yeah. it. Pump yeah. it up. Yeah. Getting carried away with extravagant dramatic gestures. Could we build me a living plus house? Maybe clouds appear above the house? And pushing the business projection numbers to an ethically treacherous place. Yeah. Numbers get crazy good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but while Roman snaps and responds to his authority being challenged by becoming the petulant boy man, Kendall surprisingly holds himself together. When Carl tries to put Kendall in his place, Kendall just smiles, sticks to his plan, and controls the situation to suit himself. Detailed financials I will leave to Carl Mueller, our legendary CFO. There he is. Round of applause. What happens next is very illuminating and reveals some key things about what it actually takes to succeed in this kind of position. It's not actually about whether the numbers are true. Huh? I think we can make Duke's the up. argument. We can yeah. make the argument. Yeah. Or about whether the leader is being smart and certainly not sensible. Instead, in this moment, it's about going big because only a huge play could stop the Gojo deal from going through, as Kendall tells Roman. It's numbers. Time. It's time. It's big swing time. A key thing that characters like Lucas Madsen also demonstrate to us is that this elite stratosphere of success isn't primarily about any kind of business genius. It's much more about cold-blooded ruthlessness, a certain instinct for battle, and a flair for drama. He's uh, a genius. Nobody minds a genius acting weird. Honestly, it probably kind of adds to the mystique. And his reputation is priced in. Schiff pointed out the same thing about Logan. It wasn't that he was actually always right about business, but he made everyone believe in his legend. So Kendall's problem all along hasn't necessarily been his grandiosity dreaming too big, but that until now, he's failed to convince people in large part because he didn't believe his own act himself. Even though the Roy family is drowning in money, that's not how the rest of us tend to live our lives. The average person often has to cut down on extra costs and secure savings where they can. And thankfully, today's sponsor, Rocket Money, can help you with these goals tremendously. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. I've saved a pretty penny already, so sign up today at rocketmoney.com slash the take. Did you know over 80% of people have recurring subscriptions they forgot about? It's way too easy to be part of that statistic. Never canceled that stream or free trial after binging a show? Forgot to pause your meal delivery service and got stuck with a big box of groceries you didn't want? We've all been there. But with Rocket Money, you don't have to fall into those traps ever again. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you. And for any you don't wish to keep, just hit cancel and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's great at bypassing all of the confusing cancellation steps you usually have to go through. The app also helps you manage all your finances in one place and categorizes your expenses so you can easily track your budget in real time. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash the take. That's rocketmoney.com slash the take. Actor Jeremy Strong told GQ that creator Jesse Armstrong told him to think of Shakespeare's Richard III. And we're already seeing Kendall channel that play's two-faced protagonist who plots his way to the crown by betraying and exploiting everyone in his way. Plots have I laid. Inductions dangerous. Season 4 Kendall is screwing over anyone he needs to, and crucially, appearing however he has to in order to manipulate and coerce others to obey his will. A huge step for this person who in the past was incapable of hiding anything. 
And in episode 6, while Kendall clearly is hurt when his brother abandons him, on some level during this period he could be intentionally giving Roman the space to self-destruct. After all, at the end, Kendall sends Roman this text confirming his brother's worst fears about himself. The Shakespearean vibes are especially strong in this season. Season 4, episode 5 is made to feel like a modern update to a battle out of one of the history plays. And if this is truly Kendall's story, the most important Shakespeare comparison might be Henry IV Part 1 and 2, which follow a prince named Hal who gets scolded by his dad, Henry IV, for his princely privilege and for being a shadow of succession. This is exactly how Logan and everyone sees Kendall. You're a tribute band. But Prince Hal actually does mature into a successful and powerful king, Henry V, by becoming cold inside. Something has changed in Kendall that's suddenly giving him the self-assurance not to constantly give himself away. So what's caused this difference? Of course, the main thing that's changed is his father's absence. Let's look more closely at how that's changing everything about how Kendall is. Throughout the series, there have been two Kendalls vying to dominate. One is the dynamic, cool, woke, visionary Kendall wants to be, the one who disrupts the status quo, keeps trying to kill his dad, and insists he's a good person. But after the season 2 finale gave Kendall his amazing hero moment, season 3 was careful in the aftermath not to let Kendall actually be the hero that he thinks he is for taking down his dad. Instead, it situates his business plays in childish settings like his daughter's bedroom and his birthday party recreation of his childhood treehouse to underline that even when he gets the chance to shine and do something great, the image of Kendall that's always coming through is still that of that little kid dressing up, trying to prove he can wear daddy's shoes. More importantly, that's how he feels to himself, and because of that, Kendall can't ever really convince anyone else that he's more than just a broy rich kid playing pretend. The Canadians, there seem to be a little static on some details. Like what? Like, you as CEO. Whenever he rebels, the cool people who hate his father that he tries to win over detest him too. And a pussy has ghosts in my ass. Benedict had on it. Paranoid Kendall. In part because he hasn't earned any of his success, so he's operating on a level that's disproportionate to his actual skills. And in part because they intuit Kendall's rebellion against his father is fragile. I'm not a Roy. Okay? Not not really. It sense that says you're a coked up prick who can't shit straight. Something they're proven right about repeatedly. You have 15 minutes to gather your belongings and exit the building. Why? Because my dad told me to. Because your dad told you to? So if the first Kendall is the pretend hero, the second Kendall in the series is the wounded and broken child who just wants his daddy's love and feels like a nothing. This is the one who becomes his dad's hollow soldier, whom Logan is able to manipulate by making him feel weak. He's encapsulated by the recurring image we see of Kendall, a boy underwater. In every season premiere image of Kendall, he's submerged. In the penultimate episode of season 3, he slips under and almost dies. And of course, the crisis of his character in season 1 is when he accidentally drowns a caterer boy at Shiv's wedding after driving high. This symbolism of a boy who can't lift himself above water represents Kendall's problems with substance abuse, which is one of the most true-to-life risk factors for kids who grow up affluent. And in Kendall's case, there's a clear link between using and the inability to deal with all the pain that his father causes him. All the times we see him really going on benders connect to some way that his dad callously hurt him or forced him to do something really awful, like after his father makes him shudder Walter, his pet project. Kendall summons his inner dead-eyed soldier-like resolve to get it done, and then gets high out of his mind that night to not feel it. Or look at how Kendall pretends not to care when, at their fake therapy retreat, his dad says, You are a f***ing nobody. He's smiling, but very soon after, you can see how the comment hurt him, and again, he takes a drink. After Logan manages to leverage Kendall's guilt about the caterer boy to crush the rebellion of season 1, season 2's Kendall the Robot is a direct result of Kendall shutting off from his emotions because processing what he feels about the boy's death is too challenging. The broken robot version of Kendall is always about to crumble and utterly dependent on his dad. If dad didn't need me right now, I don't exactly know what I would be for. To the point that when Kendall becomes obsessed with a new fling, a mere facial expression from Logan is enough to instantly kill that attraction. She's in theater. Oh. Anyways, this is so awesome. Yes, it is. 
Logan likes Kendall weak so he can control him, though at the same time he doesn't respect this Kendall who's his pawn, and we can see clearly how this Kendall results from his dad's abuse. In the penultimate episode of season 3, Logan has his own grandchild sample his food just to underline how willing he is to let Kendall and Kendall's children die for him. When Kendall tries to assert, I'm better than you. Logan again brings up the boy and successfully makes Kendall feel that he's a nothing. So we see how Logan has been truly killing his son. Now that Logan's gone, that Kendall who couldn't rise above water might finally be too. At the end of season 4, episode 6, Kendall is at last floating in the water. At peace, it's partially the success of the launch, and it's also that whether it's fiction or not, post his father's death, he's achieved his father's approval, at least within his own mind. The belief that his father wrote his name on that piece of paper and did want it to be Kendall has reactivated that drive in him. My dad wanted me to take over. After all, we see Kendall looking at that paper right before his scene with Hugo. Just before he gets into the ocean at the end of episode 6, he writes a number one in the sand. Seemingly a reference to being told he's his father's number one boy. So Kendall does seem to have finally convinced himself that his father loved and believed in him, even if it could be a deliberate act of self-delusion. In episode 6, at the start, we see Kendall watching footage of Logan criticizing his children. You're as bad as my f***ing idiot kids! But by the end of the episode, Kendall has resurrected his father and even edited his father's words to create the Logan who showers benevolent love on his son. Thank you, Dad. With all this play acting of his dad's fake ghost, Kendall has been weirdly freed from his actual dad's toxicity. And more than trying to please that person, Kendall is trying to become like his father. It's what he would do. He'd want this for the firm. We still see his siblings wondering what his father would want, whereas Kendall is paradoxically not worrying about what his dad would think. What do I think he would do? Yeah. Have exactly whatever the f he wanted. He's consciously trying to morph into the cold king by doing whatever he wants. That's not to say his elated floating amidst the waves moment signals he's free from danger. Strong told Vulture that even in the aftermath of his dad's death, Kendall is still wrestling with these two identities of his super being and his wraith. The super being is what we see coming to the forefront here, but the wraith is waiting in the wings, hiding in plain sight at all times to pull him down. But while that grandiose super being is still strong in him, importantly, he's given up the hero Kendall delusions about trying to do good in the world. He hasn't the slightest moral objection to making up numbers that everyone else is pretty scared by, and manipulates video of his father to lie to shareholders. Hey, dude, it's enough to make you lose your faith in capitalism. Like, right, you could say anything. Strong and Vulture's Matt Zoller seats also discussed how Kendall emerging from the water after the caterer's death in season one could be his satanic rebirth. And ever since that moment, as Kendall has gradually accepted the boy's death, he's experienced a moral attrition. It's a process that Strong and the team have likened to Michael Corleone's spiritual corruption in The Godfather. So from all this, we can infer there's a chance that Kendall's wraith will return, and he'll come crashing down from his close to the sun moment. And there still remains the pesky question of whether Kendall is truly smart enough to pull all this off in a sustained way. The movie. And what about these f***ing press stories? Are you Scooby-Dooing me here? Even though Kendall has risen to the occasion so far, it's still early days. Well, Ken and I have been doing a pretty good job in the last 24 hours. And if he is Richard III, in that play, the slimy hero doesn't last all that long as a king. Yet more central than this question of whether he'll keep the crown is the tragedy we're witnessing of what's happening to him inside this show that's, Strong says, ultimately about family trauma and a satire of late-stage capitalism. As both of the false Kendalls, the pretend hero and the broken robot, finally fade away, we're seeing him at last integrate his selves into a new Kendall that was always waiting in the wings. The Broy Logan Roy tribute band, who's at last getting his shot to rule the kingdom, channeling that Viking spirit to become a fierce Logan 2.0, and play some killer originals as well. That's the take. Click here to watch a video we think you'll love, or here to check out a whole playlist of awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.